everyone. <laughs> so, you know, those were me. Yeah, those are mine. <laughs> uh, so, welcome, William Forsyth of the Devil's Rejects. Yeah. Sight. <laughs> Where's your Scottish blood? You know, come on. All right. Um, so, I'm going to dive right in because Sheriff Whitehall is quite a complex character. So there's a lot of, a lot of layers that we got to go through. Uh, he's a member of the police and believes he's on the side of good in the film. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. he, he does some pretty yeah. horrific things, um, which are arguably worse than the villains of the film. How do you prepare for a role like that? Well, you know, to be honest, the, the, what made this character so interesting and, and the reason that I got involved with the movie is I, when the minute I looked at the script, I hadn't seen House of a Thousand Corpses. And I didn't really know Rob's work at the time at all. But when I looked at the script, it just called out to me that this character was this full-on uh, John Wayne-esque, strong, powerful guy that had spent his entire life living on the side of good and taking care of things you know, for all the right reasons. An odd story. I pulled in front of the building that Rob Zombie's office was on. I hadn't met Rob yet. We had only talked on the phone. And right outside the building was a gigantic statue of John Wayne. It's, <laughs> the building had once been um, a bank. And the statue of John Wayne, I mean, I'm not kidding you. It's humongous. You look straight up to it, maybe 25, 30 feet. It's, a, it's on horseback. I looked at that and I couldn't believe it. I called up Rob and I was like, um, hi, Rob? And he's like, hey, good, come on up. I go, no, 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 come down. And he, he goes, you can feel that pause, like, what is with this dude? And, and I go, no, come down, come down. So he came down and we actually met right in front of the John Wayne statue. And, and I said, that's exactly who he is. That's who he thinks he is. That's, that's his model. That's the guy he is. I mean, obviously, up until that very strange scene with his brother, which the transition begins, and suddenly the white hat comes off. And once that white hat comes off, if you look at the film again, it, it all hell breaks loose the moment that hat comes off. And he suddenly, he, his, his sense of vengeance and all the things that he wants to do, the, the places that he goes, are all based in a very dark place. And, that, and that's where the the story turns for us. But I don't feel any sympathy for them, you know. <laughs> Free bird my ass. <laughs> oh, oh, let's cry over about the serial killers. Come on. <laughs> Put, them out. Put them out with the rest of the garbage. <laughs> no, true that. The greatest people to work with. Um, the movie, I, I got invited in to be part of a family. I didn't really know that. I, I just showed up to do my job. And as it turned out, it ends up being a family and a wonderful group of people. And Rob is a beautiful, conscientious director. He, you know, he, he wants you to deliver what you bring, but at the same time, he very much, um, you know, he, he cares, he knows exactly what he wants, but he, he sits there in a very intelligent way and lets it come about. And, and he does something that only great directors do, and he encourages the work encourages you to reach inside and come up with things. Other people can be more like, no, that's not really the way I want. I, you know, and they, right away it creates a negativity and you don't do your best work that way. So, great bunch all the way around. Um, there's been a lot of comparisons between Sheriff Wydell and George W. Bush. Was this a conscious <laughs> no, choice? No, there is no, there's, there, no, that's absurd. I mean, that's, it's absurd. I mean, it's a George W. Bush. Come on. No, that's a, that's completely wrong and completely absurd. You know, I mean, in my opinion, it is. I mean, I, I I wouldn't sit there thinking about something like that. Where's where's the fuel in that? You know. So no, absolutely not true. Some online fantasy. Yeah. We can put the theory to bed now. We've got the answer. Yes. <laughs> Um, so Sheriff Whitell, when uh, you mentioned this sort of descent um, that happens at a key shift uh, with the death of his brother, he goes as far as to hire two hitmen, he actually sadistically tortures the Firefly family. 
Is it difficult to Sadistically, deal with? after all the things they did? <laughs> I mean, come on, come on, to see them getting a little comeuppance, please. In my movie, they'd still be hanging on a hook. <laughs> come on! Oh, 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 please. <laughs> somebody's face off? I mean, yeah. oh, they poor, did. those poor, poor fireflies. I literally, I'm, I kid you not, I went to see it in a movie theater, and you know, I like to do that. I like to go in and see how the audience responds to it. And, you know, something, I, I get my neck snapped like a, you know, a chicken wing or something, and, 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 and suddenly free bird starts, and I turn around, and there's this galoot, you know, with... Ooh, this here coming out of his eye, and I turned around and said, you are one sick motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, what are you crying about? The fireflies? <laughs> no, it's, it's, but that's the genius of the movie, honestly, that somehow he, he makes you fall in love with these horrible, horrible people, you know, mm -hmm. and, and somehow you fall in love with them, and, and you, you hate reason, and you hate good guys, and you hate, you know, <laughs> There it is. Yeah. Why do you think the fireflies have this staying power? Like the love just seems to keep growing. I, I don't know. I mean, the fans are loyal. Everyone loves. Uh, people love the characters. People love the, the, the films. I mean, look, the Devil's Rejects has carried the torch for quite a, quite a long time. Until now, we're we're about to, see, or we are seeing, um, you know, the next phase of the, of the piece. I don't know. It, it, it's irreverent. The characters are irreverent. I mean, you've got people who, like, again, mass murderers talking about tootie fucking free. <laughs> <laughs> like, God bless Sid. I'm going to Sid, you know. But to make, to make an audience go on a journey like that is, it, it, it's really unique. It really is unique. And I, it, for me, if, if you were to see Wydell on a day where you would see what he's truly like, because for the whole movie, he's on the mission. Mm -hmm. I mean, the moment it starts, there's one moment in the movie, it's this tiny little scene, basically, where I show up and the other sheriff, played by, you know, the wonderful, you know, Steve Railsback, and you just see this moment where two guys are sitting there going, oh, so what's going on? I don't know, I don't know, some of the names, he only speaks Espanol. What am I, the mayor of fucking Tijuana? He goes, and it's just, but you see, these two guys, and you see the way he really is as a person, or what he would have been like as a person, but it's only a clip that's maybe 30 seconds in the film, but it's these two guys that you see who they are, or you see who Wydell really would be in on the normal day of his life. So. I love that clip, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm at the bear, I'm, I love Rails Back. He's one of the kindest, sweetest, most brilliant actors that have uh, ever lived. And he does great Q&As if you ever get a chance. He's fabulous. He really cares. Great Charles Manson. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the irony of it all. It's that, you know, the, one of the kindest, gentlest, most amazing people I know, you know, played the most version of Charles Manson you will ever see. Uh, you mentioned the dialogue. <coughs> what was it like when you got the script? Because Rob has such a distinct writing style. He um, does, he does, but he's also very, um, you know, he's wonderful with allowing and, and, like I say, adding to an environment of, of you bringing what you bring to the table. He wants what he has and he wants what he wants, but he's very open to allowing all of the good things to happen. I mean, he encourages you to make things up and to keep playing with it and keep discovering new ways to do it. So a lot of times there'd be takes that would just be one take where something would happen. Like I remember when the, uh, one, um, my favorite scene, well, look at my Elvis hat. I love the scene with, with the critic where we discuss Elvis and Groucho and all that. And I love that scene with all my heart because here he is, this nervous little guy coming in, knocking Elvis. And originally, he was knocking Elvis, and my guy didn't really do anything. Mm -hmm. And I, I told Rob, I said, Rob, I said, I, I can't let him get away with, it, you know, <laughs> shitting on the king like that. This is wrong. <laughs> and Rob goes, well, do whatever you think is right. You know, so... If you see the film again, look at the look on his face, the uh. film critic, when I go, what'd you say about the kid? <laughs> <laughs> and then when I grab him, he's, <laughs> he has no 
idea it's coming. You know, it's, it's so good. I know what I'm doing. We're all going. Like, ah! yeah. And 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 to express something like that, it, especially at that that time, that moment. I mean, when you know, I mean, Rob loves the '70s. Mm -hmm. Our first discussions about film, we were talking about Lee Marvin and Robert Shaw, and we were talking about all these great, strong guys that were, you know, the the men of that era, and, and he loved it. He just, I mean, that's what he loves. He, for some reason, he connects with that totally. And so we, you know, we, we did it. We have our set of these guys. Yeah. You know. <laughs> um, so whether... These are crazy mics, you know. <laughs> you're super sensitive. You're either, like, yelling or you're too quiet. <laughs> Long. <laughs> Whether or not we read Wydell as maybe the villain or the hero, he, it's a dark character in the sense that he goes through some pretty brutal things. Is there well, a way that you... Well, when he that? makes his transition, you know, I, I told, I, I asked Rob, I said, look, Rob, we have a very small, quick transition that we make. Like, we basically have a, a nightmare or whatever you want to call it where his brother appears, and from there, we start to move in another direction. So I asked him, I said, listen, I really believe we need, with all my heart, we need a scene where you see this transition, where you see in Wydell this thing brewing where it begins to go this other direction. And that's when Rob allowed me to, to get in the mirror and do that scene in the mirror, which I did completely as an improv. And he allowed me, to, you know, I mean, I look, that's his trust and his greatness as a director. He allowed me to have that moment, and I think that moment really opens the door where you see, oh my God. I mean, these are the, look, just imagine members of your family, anybody, I mean, you know, people, I mean, the horrors that these people committed to them, I mean, you know, any person can go to a place that is, I mean, look, I can go way beyond that, even. It's, I mean, if you're, are you kidding me? So, it, it, it really, the movie required for me to at least make that transition much more strong and, and when I did that thing in the mirror, because there are moments I'm in the mirror, I'm like, who the hell is this guy? I don't even know who it is, you know, when I'm looking at what I'm doing there. And when you really realize who, you know, what is behind this guy, what is behind his motivations of vengeance, and, 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 a, and a kind of vengeance that if, if not everyone in the world would do, certainly everyone can feel, you know, so. You know, so. That's great. And then the white cowboy act comes off, and that's it, all hell breaks loose. Um, so you mentioned John Wayne. Were there other references um, or no, I, that inspirations? One, that one just came up because it just felt that way. It felt mm -hmm. like he was somebody that lived that code, mm -hmm. that old code. We'll call it the code of the West, the code of the <laughs> law. But you know, but it, but he's he is a one hundred percent a good guy, one hundred percent. And and like anyone else. If you allow the darkness to come in while you while you're seeking, you know, once you become what they are, because that's all he does is he becomes what they are, and for some reason, you know, fucked up audience decides he's the bad guy and they're good guys. But it's it you know it, it's the ability to go on that journey, and and I didn't really pick I didn't really have anyone else. The John Wayne thing kind of had it occurred to me, and then when I saw the statue, yeah. it was it was it was like a miracle. Yes, there he is. So, you know. mm. The film, when I watch it, it has kind of like a heat to it, if I can describe it that way. It everyone is covered in like a sheen. It's of the oil, nastiest. You, it, it's the worst place in the world. Yeah. It is the anal hole of America. <laughs> I mean, it's this filthy, dirty. Dirty, nasty, <laughs> desert, rotten. Even that motel, yeah. like I wouldn't even walk in that motel. It so was, that was also, you felt that on set. Oh, it is completely like that. And yet, this entire family, all these wonderful people are having the best time. And we're all have, you know, we're laughing. And there's camaraderie. And we're in the worst possible place. You might as well be yeah. in hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, hence the three from hell. <laughs> um, the film has several shootouts. What was it like filming those? Well, you know, like practical. A, a lot of times today, when we, we 
do shootouts and things like that, we back off it now. They have all these toys and all. I mean, it, it just doesn't feel like the good old days when when we would go in and we'd really do a, the shootout. So they're good. But but of course, I, I I go to Rob. I go, Rob, come on. The opening of the movie. I go, yeah. If I'm going to sneak up on a family of, of serial killers, I'm going to totally get out the megaphone and go, yes, we're coming in. Load your guns. <laughs> By all means, you know, try to shoot as many of us as you can as we're coming in the door, you know. So, you know, I mean, I look at that and I'm like, whoa. It's, you know, because I'm not. I'm coming in. You're going to see me when your eyes open. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah. Um, I'm always compelled about the excess of zombies films, whether it's the decor, the violence, uh, the color. Um, what is it like? Cause, I mean, The Devil's Rejects is a brutal film to watch. And what yet it's like? not. And yet, if you really think about it, some of the worst images of the film are in your mind. Mm. They're not right there on the screen. You're not seeing all of those things. You, you get to go with it to a point. Mm -hmm. You see the suffering around it. You see things like that. But the actual things, you, they're not necessarily mm -hmm. right there for the taking. Uh, yeah, Rob does like the heat. I mean, I remember when, when I saw <coughs> I saw the second Halloween he did, and I went, and I went to Rob. I go, um, am I wrong? But wasn't you know wasn't that like extremely violent even for yeah. you? He, and he's like, well, maybe that's how I felt about the studio at the time. <laughs> and I was, and I was like, okay, got it, <laughs> got it. But they are. I mean, it, it's it's a style. It's definitely a style. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna go after anything, I mean, you're going after the wild bunch at that moment. You're taking elements of that kind of film and and, and you're adding it into a whole different. Because I never considered Devil's Rejects a horror film. Mm. Yeah, it's it's not really a horror film. Horrible things happen in the film, and we end up going on that journey. But it's not really a mm. horror film. Well, that's, so that leads to a question I was going to ask. Of the film often get gets lumped into the torture porn category, uh, which is violence and gore for a feast for the eyes like oh, pornography. God, I hate and it, it's always this three the people list, and the devil's rejects is always on there. Everybody's got a fucking opinion. It's stupid. It's not. I mean, it's 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 way smarter than anything like that. People just have no. They have too much time on their hands, and they have to sit around making comparisons and things like that. It's not. I mean, I look. The reason it's not is because it's really good. Okay, now things that are like that, and believe me, I've done enough conventions where people hand me uh, movies and they go, oh, see my new film, and I look at it, and it's a couple of nuns being brutalized or something, and, and it, there's plenty of movies like that that are made without any, but there's a lot of thought, and, the, and there's a lot more going on mm -hmm. with The Devil's Rejects, a lot more. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a really good film, or we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it exactly. all these years later. Exactly, oh yeah. It has that lasting power. Um, I have one more theory question, which I know you're the biggest fan of. But it's, it's a lot of these films that have that lasting power, they get these debates going. Um, and so one of them is whether or not The Devil's Rejects is a sequel to House of a Thousand Corpses. What do you think of that? Well, it is because it was. Mm -hmm. But it, it <laughs> one thing about... The Devil's Rejects is it stands on its own. If The Devil's Rejects were just made by itself with no before or after, this movie would completely stand on its own the way it is. Um, I, I like Rob's work. I, I, I like his take on things. But I think The Devil's Rejects was his absolute number one film. I think it's, it, it, it is the most complete film that Rob directed. And for whatever reasons, the, the the intensity of the characters, the combination, how it was shot, it, it to me, it's 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 an outstanding film for all of those reasons. Well, and it's it's interesting because I often hear, you know, it's these characters are so extreme and we have violence, but it sounds like it was a very warm. I don't mean temperature wise, but well, the PC like crowd has been getting at it. <laughs> I mean, it's, come on, what are we trying to hide from it? I mean, humanity, you know, I mean, somebody, I was just 
reading something about Carthaginia, and, and I'm going, well, they sure took care of that problem, didn't they? They put everyone to the sword. The people forget humanity is, is humanity, and humanity has done horrible things in time. And now we want to try to live in a world where we want to try to act like that never happened. But it didn't. Yeah. And it may happen again. And that's yeah. the reality of it. So, I mean, that's why we like these films. That's oh, why we yeah. go on these journeys. Yeah. It is. It can be. Uh, Make friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, and from what I hear, the actual set life was very, um, everyone was very close is what it sounds like, and everyone really connected behind the scenes. Um, do you have any stories? Of well, it, it, it is, but yet yeah. there are still fun moments. I mean, of course, you know, it was funny because, of, you know, Ken, you know, Big Ken, and, uh, and, and it was funny when we were working on the, on the film, I mean, Ken is just Big Ken. I mean, he, he, he's not, not going to be afraid of this or that. And I'm suddenly, I have a scene with him, and I'm trying to lay the law down on him, and he's just smirking at me. And I'm going, <laughs> all right. I, uh, so he forgot that he was leaning on the car when he was smirking, so at the right moment, I just moved the door a little, and his finger got caught in there. And, oh, he goes like this. And I, so, you know, it's just this little moment, because I... I, I'm like, listen, man, you can't be smirking at me like that. I'm telling you this. You know, there's, you know, I don't care who you think you are or what you are. There's, there's a certain point where, you know, we're, we're people, we're humans. You know, I mean, if the Roman army could have a, a bad day, so can you. And, uh, and so, but, but it was funny. I, and that one always stood out. Ken got so mad at me, but I was like, look, brother, the scene is great. You know, try to, try to relate to the fact that that little moment, you know, it, it made you. It gave you some vulnerability. You know? <laughs> uh, naturally, uh, given his background, music plays such a role in zombies films. Was that, uh, could you, was there the sort of key scene, of course, Freebird, was that already planned, the music key? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't, no, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. It didn't surprise me, of course, uh, you know, music, uh, I mean, Yes, music is such an important part, and the period music and all the things that went with it, I think, are really important to it. I mean, I, I myself use music as well when, when I'm creating things, and it, it's generally a part of a mood. And you, so, to me, I always try to find anything that takes me to a place, that takes me to a mood. Um, and sometimes when the moods are complex, that's, that's when all the great music comes in, because mm -hmm. the complexity of music. And, but most things are like that. Mm -hmm. Most mm -hmm. films, I mean, it, it's a story. And so a story has many different sides to it. And the music is very, very important. And, and obviously in Rob's films, it, it rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were also in uh, Zombies 2007 Halloween remake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but how was that? <laughs> I broke, uh, like I severed my tendon. Uh, I, Rob and I, had, Rob goes, oh, I've got this great part I want you to play. I go, great, Rob, I'd love to work with you again. He sends it over, and I, I come, I go, Rob, are you kidding me? I said, this is what you think of me? <laughs> like, you know, I said, this guy, they wouldn't even allow him in a trailer park. I mean, this is the worst <laughs> human being that you know, ever, you know, and, and he goes, yes, I know, I want, you know, I want. And, you know, and, and it was so funny. So now, I, Rob and I had discussed using an arm cast for the character. So I called him up, I severed my tendon uh, 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 near uh, Lake Champlain. I was looking at a farm and I took this horrible fall and I, I severed my tendon 90%. It took me two years to be able to walk again and run and everything. And I called up Rob and I go, Rob, you know, like, uh, we're going to have to add a second cast. I said, we'll put something on his leg because you know, so he's like totally a roach who can't move. So, and, and I loved it because it ended up being this perfect image of this guy who, you know, he's all mouth. He can't do anything else. So it ended up working perfectly for us. But I shot that with my, with my, um, my, my tendon severed. And then the moment we finished the film, I went and I got my surgery done right after that. And so it was... But it was funny, that movie, my God, every take, Rob goes, more, more, <laughs> give Sherry shit, uh, do horrible things to her, you know, I'm like, okay, sure, buddy, <laughs> so, okay, next take, I mean, I mean, I look at myself, you know, I jokingly told my, well, half jokingly told my sister, I said, you know, I modeled that character after, I said, one of your ex-husbands. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's so much fun to be able to go that ugly and dirty, and, and I couldn't do it enough. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I would do something I think was despicable, and Rob would go, more, let's see, more, <laughs> more. And then I would suddenly start making up things. But the funniest one ever was when I'd go, I, I, and I, I think I only did a one take, or if I did, I repeated it. And I go, bitch, I will crawl over there and I will skull fuck this shit. And, you know, and after the take, you know, Sherry goes, what does that mean? <laughs> It's so great that Sherry's, you know, she's in, there's an innocence to her that I love, I just adore. And, but I, every one, you know, the dumper line, uh, you know, just, you could, people remind me of them, they come up to me and go, can you write this? And I go, oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> it's like one horrible thing after the other. Yeah. And then the baby cry, which I have yeah. no idea where that came from. I discovered on the set that I could do that. I saw the, you know, and I'm like, I didn't even know where it came from, but that, you know, again, it's the fun of working with people that you have trust, and, 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 and they trust each other, and, and you go out there and have fun, you know. <laughs> Ronnie White, <laughs> child care specialist, yes. So do you do a lot of improv then, on, on the sets, or? Well, well yeah, I mean, it, it really depends, I mean, I, yes, I do. I, I work, but it's not just improv, to be totally honest. When I work on something, I, I, I spend, I mean, I know actors that, you know, they look at it and they go, I'm ready. You know, that's not me. I spend thousands of torturous hours creating things. And so it's not just improv. When I sit down at the mirror, for instance, that scene that was improv, but yet at the same time, I put a lot of thought behind where I'm going. There's a plano. There's something in my head about what I see and where I want it to go. And so there's a lot of, of that. But then w when you can, you open up and let it fly. And, and, and Rob's sets are, are great for that. I mean, he's, he's great for that. He encourages it. And, and he laughs. He laughs during the take. Yeah. You know, like he, he fucks up a take. You know, yeah. you hear a laughter over in the corner. I'm like, it's Rob? <laughs> because he, you know, he's having fun. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, is there something about the horror genre that attracts you as an actor? I don't know. I never, you know, I, I never considered myself, you know, somebody who loved horror. And if I like horror or I love horror, I like classic horror. I, I don't, I'm not into gore horror. Mm. I'm not into, you know, mutilating a baby. I'm not, I'm not into anything like that. My sense of what horror is, is to is to take something, make it scary, make it to take it to a place where you're not sure what's going to happen, and then tease the audience with it the rest of the way. I like the classics that way. I mean, you won't, I you you will not see me lining up to see you know whatever Saw Twelve. Or, <laughs> I'm just it's just not who I am. But I can appreciate people liking that, you know. But I don't understand. <laughs> uh, what advice do you have? For either actors uh, looking to enter the business, or what do you find another business? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, it, yeah, I have, you know, I have a young son, and he, you know, he, he's. I could see he already, and I, I just said, listen, if you want to do something like this, you have got to want it more than anybody else. You have got to work harder than anybody else. You can't just be a dilettante who shows up and expects to get, and, and a lot of people are like that now. You, I mean, to me, if you want to do something like this, because your chances of not achieving what you want and of, 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 of it having it turn on you in a way that is not very good and not very nice, it's, it's a big chance that's going to happen. So you have to want this with all your heart and soul, and you have to work, work harder than any person there is in order to, in my opinion, in order to have a chance of standing up at all. And so, uh, it, advice, I'm not really much for giving advice, but uh, surround yourself with like-minded people. Surround yourself with people who, who share your desires and your love to do something craft or an art or whatever it is that you choose to do and 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 then make sure that your lifestyle or what you do complements that and you know because you you live small 
You have to. I mean, I, my God, I, I, I laughingly say thank God there weren't any Starbucks when I, when I was a starving actor because that was my whole food budget for a week, one coffee. You know, I lived on nothing. You know, we, there was no money. Uh, acting class was first, and then it, I made my way down the line, and rent was last. But it was, you know, it was, I had a list of, of what came first. And, 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 and when there was nothing, there was nothing because you had to, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of, there's a, let's put it this way, there's a lot of people that have great, wonderful talent that never get a chance to do it. And it's sad. It's sad, especially when you know they've done it the right way. You know? And then there's other people that haven't got a lick of talent <laughs> and, they, and, and, you know, and, and <laughs> there we are, the envelope, please. And it, 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 it's very strange that way. So you have to love it for yourself. You have to love it because you love it. And, and, and lead your life. Don't, don't let the world or the industry or anything else lead your life for you. That's all I can, I can say about it. Uh, I have one more question before we open it up, and that's this weekend, the amount of times I've heard People refer to your House of a Thousand Corpses and the Devil's Rejects as cult hits. Uh, it's been that means so we're getting many. old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what do you think? I mean, we've talked about the characters, but what do you think it is about that lasting power that you know, people are getting tattoos from these films? That they really but they have always did. I mean, my mm -hmm. God, I mean, the, one of the first conventions I ever went to, I had this woman come up to me and she wanted me to sign her ample <laughs> bosom. And the next thing I know, I, I signed it and, 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 and I came back. And, she had it tattooed. <laughs> I looked at her husband, not her. I went, are you crazy? I said, you might as well tattoo my face on her butt. And I was like, you know, it, it's, you know. But I applaud the enthusiasm. I just love the fact that fans care that much and that there's some kind of thing inside that makes you want to do it. And I, I, love, I love that because let me tell you something. Horror fans... One thing I discovered, I didn't know when I did my first convention if I would be able to, because I, I lay off to the side. I'm the guy who watches people. I don't, I, you know. And when I, I went to do my first show, I thought, my God, I, I think I might hate this. I'm not sure, because it, you got to come out of your shell in order to do it. But I was blown away by fans. Honestly, people who are horror fans are the greatest movie fans. They don't just know the horror genre. They know film. And it really blew me away, and it's the only reason I still you know, go to conventions, is because I, I hear the most refreshing things come out of the mouths of fans, and I, re I really appreciate it, so that's why I'm here. So. Awesome. Come on, <laughs> bless you. <laughs> we thank you for being here. Let's open it up. Any questions? We have time for some, yeah. Uh, were you disappointed that you were not in uh, Three from Hell? Because I was. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> a couple of years, I'm going to need a new agent. <laughs> Good job. Well, you know, to be honest, I, you know, that's an interesting question. It's a really interesting question. In fact, I told Rob, uh, uh, I think it was about six weeks ago. I told him, I said, honestly, Rob, I felt like I got dumped by my best girl. You know, I, I, I said, what, you know, I was, I, it, it, it hit me in a way where I, I thought, well, everybody else was dead too. What's going on here? But, I mean, not really. It, but at the same time, there, there definitely was a thought like that. But that thought is only because of how wonderful the experience was between us all. And, and, and I knew they were going to march on. And I know one day we'll work together again. But, it, yeah, yeah, definitely, for, it, it hit me in a way like, well, what? Are you serious? You're going to go on without me? What? <laughs> Good question. Uh, we'll go here. Actually, I got two. Uh, about Sid Hag, what's your take on him? Is he kind of, is he what everyone thinks he is? He was the matriarch, you know? That ah, he's a fuck. What do you say about a guy like Sid? I mean, Sid became a friend. I spent a lot of hours with him. I, I, you know, sometimes on the shows, we'd end up together and, and, uh, what I love about Sid is you'll be sitting there watching something in the middle of the night and, and suddenly there will be Sid, you know, <laughs> from way back when, from all the years that he put in the time to be, to be an actor. I mean, there's an example right there. It's not easy. You spend a lifetime putting in. I, I am very happy that Rob gave him the opportunity to get the recognition that Sid ended up getting. 
from all of you and from everyone else. And I loved Sid. He was a, you know, just a unique guy and funny. And, f and I love when he would lose his temper. <laughs> that was one of my favorites when he'd just go, get this fucker away from me. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and if you know him, you remember him, and he was nice. I mean, he, you know, he was great to the fans. But there'd be a moment when it would be like, okay, that's it. <laughs> but you know, I love him. I mean, he, he's, he's, he's to be missed. And, I, and you know, it's funny. I, I, I told Bill this last night. I, I don't know why I didn't know anything about what was happening with Sid's health, but the last time I saw him, I walked up to him and I was like, he goes, what? I go, give it up. And I made him give me a big hug. And we had this hug. You know, and I'm so glad that I did that, you know, now that, you know, that he's gone. Because, you know, he was, you know, he was a unique and, and, and interesting cat, man. You know, God bless him. The other one I was going to ask, nothing to do with that, but uh, and you might not want to answer. Which the the, the movie you're just you don't even like talking about? That you've done. I, I'll talk about movies. You know, the the hardest movie I ever did by far was when I played Casey, um, by far, um, because when I first started out, I didn't want to do it. They offered it to me. I, 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 I'm going to turn this down. I'm going to turn this down because I knew the journey I would have to go on to get him. And finally, it was my daughter. She told me. She said, "You should do it, Dad." She said, "You'll," she said, "You'll, you'll, you'll teach the world something in this because you you don't quit when it comes to getting it right." And then I go to Chicago to do my research. When some of you guys came to the table and I discussed today, and the um, the minute I got there, suddenly it, it was weird. All the doors started getting slammed in my face and. And, and I started feeling this very strange vibe. Nobody wanted to talk to me about it. And then it dawned on me. I said, there's so much more to this story than anyone has ever told. And so I, I, I canceled everything I had. I even canceled a job. And I went and I spent six weeks in Chicago basically being a detective. I was going to find out who the hell he was. And I did. And I mean, I, to the point where I honestly believe I discovered where there were more bodies and everything else. But, you know, I started to do things. And, and to be honest, the, the story, the deeper you get into it, the harder it was. It, it, it's a terrible, terrible story and about a guy who thrived in society. He thrived in society. Most people that have been serial killers, they got by in society. He thrived in it. He, he loved the crowd and being with the people. And the more I got to know him, the, you know, and I was determined to expose his secrets, and I, I think I did. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure wherever he is, he hates my guts, and I hate you too. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big cool old man. <laughs> Over here. Can I ask a non word question? Of course. <laughs> you mean the first? You know, nine tenths of my life. <laughs> can you describe, and I'm probably boring people, but can you describe sort of what it was like to work for Sergio Leone? No. Oh. Uh, my all time favorite movie. That's a beautiful that. question. And uh, Sergio, of all the directors I've ever worked with, Sergio Leone had the greatest eye. And I've worked with some great people and great eyes. He. Everything he saw was a complete vision. <laughs> he, the way he looked, you, even when he met me, he's watching me, he's looking at me, and he's, he's framing me. Mm. There was something in him, and he was such a perfectionist. And, and we, I remember once we spent a week in Canada. We wouldn't shoot. We were up uh, at Trois Rivières up there, uh, outside of Montreal. And some days, it was raining, and other times it was just a little cloudy, whatever it was. But we would not shoot. He would not shoot a frame unless it was exactly perfect the way he, he imagined it. And you'll never see that again. You will never see that kind of filmmaking again. He was, you know, he gave me the break of a lifetime. He, you know what he said to me? I auditioned, I put a tape together, and, and it was something I wrote. By the time I got home, I had a message to come back to the Chateau Marmont Hotel. 
And I came back, and there he was. He was wearing a robe, and he was a big, <laughs> big man, and he looked like Zeus or something. And he's just sitting there, and, he, and he's watching me as I come in the door. <laughs> and, and the hands go up, and he's... And he, I couldn't believe it. He sat me down, and he told me, basically, that when he dreamed of this character, he always saw my face. You know, and I went, oh, this is good. <laughs> this is going to be good. And he, you know, he, it was something, he goes, you, and this is another oddity, life is funny. When I was doing my monologue that I wrote, my grandfather, my grand and when my grandfather would get angry, he would do something. You'd see this, first it would happen here, and the eye would go. And then you'd something, and you could tell me, if you were smart, you started moving in the other direction. <laughs> and so I used that in my monologue that I wrote. And so what it was, I kept doing this thing with my eye. I had no idea there was this character. And he says to me, you, he goes, you, when you do your monologue, he go, you, you do the thing with your eye. He go, in my movie, there's a character called Kaka. And I'm like, oh, this is even better. <laughs> this is going good. And then we had this beautiful meeting, and at the end of the meeting, he said to me, the part is 90% yours. <laughs> but the other 10% took three more months, but it ended up working out. You know? He was fabulous. And the cast, and Robert De Niro. I mean, look, I, Sergio Leone I owe a career to. I'm not sure I, the rest of my career would have happened without that opportunity to, to, to do it. But also Robert. I mean, Robert had to give his approval, you know, for me to get the part. And there were, and you know, so it was a turning point in my life. I worked very hard to get there, but and then I went over there, and I'm, I, I just can't even believe what I'm seeing. I, I'm opening up. We had a scene one day where there were, I would estimate there were a thousand extras in the scene, and they were, they were all of the most beautiful women in all of Europe. <laughs> We're, we're in the scene, it was in the bordello, and it's everywhere you look, and I'm looking, my God. I mean, it was so weird that every male in the city of Rome made his way to the set that day. It was hysterical. <laughs> I mean, Anthony Quinn came walking in, it was like, and it was unbelievable, because it was magical. You know? And, I mean, to this, you know, I've had some great opportunities, and I've worked with some really, really great directors. But, you know, I owe, you know, I called him, well, my nickname for Sergio was, because Sergio was very, he, he was beautiful and lovely and fun and all that, but he was tough. He was tough, too. So I called him Santa Claus with a shiv. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was, he, you know, he, when he wanted it, and, I mean, he'd do crazy things. Like, there was a, um, we had a guy in the movie, and he, you know, this guy, I don't think this guy ever knew fear in his life. I mean, just one of those people that fear doesn't exist for them. And he wanted to get a reaction from him. And I'll never forget it. He, so he's like, Mature, which means we're rolling. And, and suddenly I look, and he's got his hand. And the prop guy walks up to him and hands him a Thompson machine gun. And he hands it, and he's blocking it with his body. Mature. And suddenly he goes, Action! And he opens up the gun, and, and he's this close, and he's firing the gun at the guy. And you see the guy, and then you got, he got the reaction he wanted. You know, so Santa Claus with the shit. <laughs> you know, we loved it, but, you know, I'm afraid that wouldn't be PC today. <laughs> Uh, so I have another non-horror question too. Uh, one of my favorite films, one of my favorite performances from you is um, Evel Stokes in Raising Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me about that character. Like, how did you get that that role, that character? You and Judd Goodman are so good in that. They movie. didn't. They, the guys didn't want to see me. They they wouldn't give me an, an audition or an interview or any. You know, um, and the reason it turned out was they thought I wanted to play the part that Goodman had, and they knew they were going to cast Goodman. And I went, no! Because their concept always for that movie was Laurel and Hardy. And I went, no, it's Hardy and Hardy. <laughs> and then, you know, so the two brothers ended up being from the same pod. And so I, and so I went in, and, 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 and it became mine. And I had a fabulous time doing the movie. You know, I, it, it, for me, it was, it was a different kind of film. I kind of came into the world of acting, I guess, 
people, you know, just to give it a name. You know, uh, more on the, the method side of, of, of the work. I, you know, I came in from a deep like, place of trying to get it right. And I, so I showed up there, and you know, and this is this really funny movie. But if you look at the movie very closely, they, they're not playing at being funny. They, you're committed to what you're doing, you know. So, I mean, it, it was a, I'll put it to you this way. To this day, the movie is still funny. It's, it, you, you watch that film, it hasn't lost a beat. It is, it is a, an outrageously funny movie. And, 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 a, and another great experience, and another door opened for me as a result of that. Though people forgot quickly that I could be funny. <laughs> uh, here? Yeah, I was worried this was going to come up when somebody asked about movies that you didn't want to talk about. Luckily, it didn't. I have to ask about Out for Justice and what it was like working on that movie. And working See, that's a good one. There's plenty of crappy movies out there that you wouldn't want to talk about. <laughs> See, <laughs> that movie, I. First of all, that was a great script. When I first read that script, that script compared to early Scorsese in terms of being a really great, fabulous movie script. And when I saw it, I was in hell. And, and he had just basically started his martial arts thing. And I, uh, I really liked it. I wanted it. And I went after it big time. And I, I mean, I, I literally, I arrived, I had done an interview in, New, in uh, L.A. And, and a reading, and I, I got past them. They liked me. So I went back to New York, and I literally spent, um, I kid you not, I arrived at the airport, I hired a car, and I had him drive me around for 24 hours, and then took me to the audition, so I'd be just like Richie when I went in the door. <laughs> and I was. <laughs> and it worked out, so. Yeah, I liked the movie. It, was it hard to make? Sometimes. Whether egos involved sometimes, but who gives a shit? It's a great movie. I mean, of that kind of film, it, it's 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 fact. I mean, it's memorable. You never stop. I mean, my God, Richie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody said to me, "You shot that woman in the head," and I go, "She called me an asshole." <laughs> <laughs> Mine's not really a question, more just like, I think you do great in comedy roles as well. <laughs> Going back to like Juice Bigelow. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you were hilarious in that. Yeah. Hilarious. Yeah. Honestly. I love I, it. Comedy is really my favorite of all yeah, things to do these days. I'd love to see more comedy yeah. for you. Oh, yeah. 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 Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be your agent. Among the classes, who's your favorite horror actor? You know, I, it, again, it comes down to, you know, I, my favorites were the original films. I mean, like, I, got, I have a young son, so I wanted, him to, I wanted him to watch black and white movies. I didn't want him to be of the, of the thought that, oh, I, you know, because a lot of kids won't watch anything. So I started him off with those kind of movies, but the comedy ones. I got him, <laughs> Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. I got him into uh, his absolute favorite, which if you haven't seen it in a long time, Abbott and Costello meet the Invisible Man. The boxing scene at the end is one of the funniest things that has ever, <laughs> left jab, left jab. <laughs> and he, you know, and it, so, you know, I, I love Bella. You know, I love Bella Lugosi. You know, I love Boris Carl. I love the, you know, I'm from those guys. Those are the ones that, you know, I, as a kid, th those were the movies that I watched. Yeah. What was it like uh, working on Dick Tracy? That seems <laughs> like it would have been big. It was, it was, it was big. I mean, Warren, first of all, I think Warren Beatty is one of the best directors I've ever worked with, and I, I just wish Warren directed maybe some more movies, because he, he's really fabulous. Warren, he decided he wanted me, and he, I mean, he, he went after me. I mean, I give him credit. He, he sent the car. We had dinner. I met him in New York. I met him in L.A. I mean, it was like he really, you know, he, he, he wanted me to be in the movie. But there was no script. You know, it was, it was, there's no script. We'll talk about that later. But, so, he hires me, so I'm like, Phenomenal! Now I'm going to work with Warren. I mean, well, he forgot to tell me he was bringing Al Pacino to play in this other role. I thought him, it was him and I going to be nemesis in the movie. Next thing I know, Al shows up, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm it, buddy. So, he, you know, he, he tricked me a little, but I'm I'm really happy I did it. I had a great a great experience. I mean, the makeup. I mean, four hours, and absolutely three in the morning. 
I remember one day I worked, I think it was a 25-hour day. I went around the clock doing it. But, I, you know, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great movie. It's great characters. And I, I, I had a way of getting Warren mad. So it was funny. Like, I went up to him one day, and he, he, got, he got mad at me. But, you know, I love Warren. And he, I said to him, I said, Warren, I said, you know, flat top. I go in the comic strips. I mean, he was smart. He was clever. I said he had a makeup kit. He used to make himself up to look, even though he always looked like flat top. I go, what's with my guy? I said, you could change the name of my character to Moose, and nobody would know the difference. And he got so mad at me. <laughs> I think the next day we had some scene where I had to do like 70 takes, and then he goes, print the first one. <laughs> I love Warren, though. I do. <laughs> we have time for one last quick question. If not, oh, yeah. What was it like uh, working on The Rock with Nicolas Cage? Because I worked with him in Raising Arizona, and he's kind of a method guy, too. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it, it, was, it was really interesting. I showed up on The Rock, and The Rock was... I'm not a big action was a big movie summer. lover, but that movie had maybe the greatest cast ever in an action movie. There, there were... 25 of the best actors of our time are in that film, so it was, it was a special movie to do. I mean, it was huge. It was huge. I had the my, my favorite story is I was on the picture two weeks, and I went over and we had switched locations, and I went over to the craft service table, which is where they have food for everybody, and I saw these poor extras. They were starving. They were standing on the side, and, and I was like, well, that's not right. Or and I went over. Next thing you know, I'm making a hot dog. And this uh, craft service lady, she comes over to me and she goes, Extras aren't allowed hot dogs! <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to have it anyway. <laughs> so I made the hot dog and so now she goes off to get reinforcements. They're going to come back and take this upstart extra and throw them off the set, you know. So I'm making my hot dog and the guy comes back over and she comes over with the guy and, and points to me and he goes, Well, that's William. He's playing, you know, and she was so mad. She was so mad that I wasn't going to get thrown off the set. You know? and, and when she was furious about it, I could see her talking to herself, walking around. And then finally, about a half an hour later, I, I walked by to get a cup of coffee, and she was still going at it. And, and she turned around, and she just goes, I don't know what to do. She goes, this person over here, they're an extra, but then they tell me they have a special bit, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I go, why don't you give her half a fucking hot dog, asshole? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.